The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel. I'm the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer. Today's episode is episode number 245. Once again, I'm going to give you my pitch. We're getting close to the end of the year. If you or someone you know or love needs to get into treatment for addiction, don't wait. Please do it now. Just a reminder to please subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And also check out our YouTube channel if you haven't already. And give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Today, we have an interview with Constance Scharf. She is an internationally recognized speaker and author on the topics of addiction recovery and mental health. She most recently served Rock to Recovery, a music-based addiction and trauma treatment program as vice president of business development. You may recall if you've been listening to our podcast that we've interviewed a couple of musicians who are involved with Rock to Recovery, Wes Gear and Brandon Jordan. Previously, Dr. Scharf was Senior Addiction Research Fellow and Director of Addiction Research for a luxury addiction treatment center based in Malibu, California. Dr. Scharf's writing centers around using complementary health and contemplative practices to improve treatment outcomes. Her latest book, Rock to Recovery, Music as a Catalyst for Human Transformation, written with Rock to Recovery co-founder Wes Gear, describes the impact songwriting and performance has on mental health. Dr. Scharf regularly travels the world speaking, teaching, and advocating for compassionate health practices that destigmatize mental health problems. Without further ado, let's talk to Dr. Constance Scharf. Constance Scharf. Do I need to call you Dr. Scharf? Whatever you like. Okay. Well, Dr. Constance Scharf, thank you for being willing to be on the podcast today and sharing your story. Thank I you. know that um, you, you're you doing a lot of really great things, but you also have your own story. I so do. if we could start with that, where did you grow up? What was your experience with drugs? I was born in uh, Fresno, California, in California's Central Valley, so the breadbasket of the nation. Uh, my parents had a were Jewish and we had a hog farm. We had hogs and raisins. Um, and so I grew up very far out in the country, um, outside of a little town called Fowler, for the people who know the area. And uh, I, you know, if your parents are Jewish and they're hog farmers, they're not, they're already not making good decisions, right? I was going to, I'm sorry, I was going to make a comment on that, like, okay, your family's Jewish and you're raising hogs. Okay. There. Right, <laughs> right. So, so we already have some questionable decision making. So my family was uh, very abusive, particularly my father. Um, before my father started um, sexually abusing me, I was actually raped and almost murdered at a public pool. Oh my gosh. I, just a month shy of my uh, seventh birthday. And so I became, you're right, I became afraid to leave the house. And my f p family didn't know anything about it because I didn't have words at that age to tell them what had happened, you know? And so um, a month later, when I, I stayed very close to my father because he was very big and very mean. And um, I knew I would be safe next to him, or I thought I would be safe next to him. And my mother went into town with my little brother to get a cake for my seventh birthday, and my father raped me for the first time. Oh. So I came, I, I remember almost nothing of the next three years until my father had a girlfriend um, and she came up, she was a prostitute, girlfriend, sugar daddy, whatever. He called her his girlfriend, so we'll use that term. She came over to the house and uh, I was washing my sheets. My mother had moved out. I was washing my sheets on like a Tuesday morning. And she said, what 10 year old child washes their sheets before they go to school? She recognized what the issue was. She looked me in the eye. She said, he'll never touch you again. And he never did. Wow. My parents divorced. I want to get to my drinking story. My, my parents divorced. I moved up with my mother uh, to Oregon uh, shortly uh, thereafter. And one day I was out at the barn doing my chores, cleaning the stall, horse stalls and whatever. And I walked into the house. My mother is not a drinker, um, but she had a little bit of alcohol up above the refrigerator for guests. I pulled down every bottle. I poured an inch out of every bottle into, you know, a highball glass and 
and uh, I stood over the sink, pinched my nose, and drank it down. Hmm. And I was immediately drunk. I put the bottles back. I went back out to the barn and I laid in the hay and I was like, this is how I want to feel for the rest of my life. And from that point on, I drank because I couldn't, I had so much trauma. I didn't know what to do with these feelings, you know? And so I drank and I drank and I drank every opportunity I had, which in Oregon back then there were state run liquor stores. You couldn't really get drugs out in the country where we lived. And so, you know, I binge drink, right? But I was drunk every time I drank. And then I had this magical thing happen. I went to college um, in Northern New York and they have these wonderful people at college. They're called 21 year olds. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, they could go to the liquor store. And so they would go to the liquor store. And, you know, the deal was one for you, one for me. And uh, I was an alcoholic by the end of, I mean, a truly by definition, alcoholic by the end of the first semester of, of college. Wow. Because I drank, I drank all the time and I drank so that I wouldn't feel. I would sit when I was a little bit older, I would sit at the bar and I would feel my index finger, right? I'd feel it. And when it felt like wood, right? When I didn't have any more feeling, when I was numb, that's where I wanted to be. Now, I'm a good alcoholic, so I kept drinking well beyond that point until I fell off the bar stool, right? But that's what I wanted. You know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous calls it drinking for oblivion. I wanted to feel nothing. And I want to say something about drugs. If drugs had been available in the country now, in the rural areas now, or then, like they are now, I'd be I'd be dead because I take everything. And I'm really only alive now because alcohol was what was available. And you throw up and you you have a longer, you have a longer shot on alcohol than you do on heroin or fentanyl or any of those sorts of, of opioids. Wow. Wow. You had unbelievable amounts of trauma to deal with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's no wonder, you know, is it was trauma the cause of my alcoholism? I, I don't know. Would I have become an alcoholic anyway? Mm, it works for me. It works for me. And so I'd say probably yes. But because I had so much early trauma, man, it worked. It worked well. It worked fast. And I and I didn't care if I was going to die. So by the time I was 22 years old, I graduated from college um, with uh, in four national honor societies with all the you know Latin and and uh, you know uh, uh, departmental honors. But I walked across the stage. I didn't really realize you're supposed to get a job after college. You know, my family it was all about education. Everybody was going to go to college, and you're going to get an education. And and so when they called my name, I was so proud. And then they called the next person's name, and I went, Oh my God, I'm unemployed, right? But I knew I was dying also. I mean, my liver and kidneys, 21, 22 years old, were giving out. So I just sort of went from temporary job to temporary job. I wasn't really good because I was drunk so much. Um, And, uh, you know, I'd show up late for work, all that kind of stuff. So they'd keep me on because, right, if it's six or eight weeks, it's not worth firing. Unless you're doing something really egregious, it's not worth firing you. Um, And so that's what I did um, until I was 22 years old and everything changed. What changed? What happened there? I was working at an outdoor school and two things happened simultaneously. Number one, there was a guy there who was in a 12 step program. He wasn't really sober, but I didn't know that. All I knew is he didn't drink. Um, he smoked, smoked a lot of marijuana, I mean, a lot of marijuana, but he had been to rehab and he knew what 12 step programs were and he knew what sobriety was, even though he wasn't doing it. And I didn't know what the rules were. So to me, he was sober. The other thing happened is that happened is my father died very suddenly of a heart attack, literally just dropped dead one night. And that was the big shift for me. I didn't care if I died. I really didn't. There was so much pain from the trauma. I have such bad uh, PTSD symptoms, especially at that point. I didn't care if I died. But when he died, I realized that I wasn't drinking at him that I was an alcoholic, that I drank because I drank. He was a convenient excuse. But when he was dead, there was no, there was no more excuse. Ah, uh, interesting, yeah. And I knew that, and I knew that. And because this guy was there, I started asking him about sobriety. 
I started asking him about sobriety and uh, this very interesting thing happened to me when I get really drunk. Now I've been sober for over 23 years, but when I get really, really drunk, English is my mother tongue, but I stopped being able to speak English and I can only speak in Spanish. Oh my goodness. But Spanish is, but of course, we, I grew up with farm workers, so my Spanish is mediocre. It's okay, right? But, I, but evidently, when I'm drunk, my Spanish is beautiful. And so this guy didn't speak Spanish, but his girlfriend did. She'd been in the Peace Corps, and so she spoke Spanish. And so I'd say to her around our campfire, I'd say, I'd say, you know, I can't, I can't stop drinking, and, and can, can this guy help me? And, and she'd translate. And then in the morning, I'd be embarrassed, right? Because he's like, I don't speak Spanish. If you want help with your drinking, you got to speak to me in English, you know? I was like, oops, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, he, he did a couple of things for me. Number one is he said, um, can you control your drinking, right? Can you just drink less? Can you moderate, right? To find out if I'm really an alcoholic or not. And so we, um, we were assigned to go. We, we worked, I worked at, this is an outdoor school and I worked in uh, Lake George, New York, uh, rural New York. But we were assigned to go to um, Matt, uh Massachusetts on the coast. And so, I, which I know nothing about marine, you know, biology, but anyway, I ran away from a horseshoe crab because I thought it had legs. I didn't know it couldn't chase me. Right. <laughs> Foolish. Anyway, but you know, ask me about bears. I know a lot about bears. So <laughs> anyway, um, we had a, we had a beer budget. And so I was challenged to only drink because I would have drunk the whole beer budget myself in the first night. I was challenged to drink only a six pack of beer a night. Well, I, I drink that. I, I could make it, eke it out to 15 minutes, but then what am I going to do with the rest of my evening? Right. right. First of all, I'm not drunk enough. And second of all, I have to like talk to people and interact and, you know, all those kinds of things. So mm, that was failure number one. And then failure number two was when we left, I was driving out to um, another job out in rural Montana and uh, we got to Bemidji, Minnesota with my, with my former workmates. And it was six days since I'd had a drink. And I left their facility in the middle of the night and I walked out to the nearest little store. I mean, in the night in, in Minnesota, right? And uh, bought myself some beer. And I was able to go six days. So I couldn't moderate how much I drank and I couldn't go any appreciable period of time without drinking. And so I knew okay, I'm an alcoholic. And finally, I moved out to uh, Southern California and this guy did also. And he got sick of me because I'd show up at his house drunk and, you know, not know where my car was having driven three hours, you know, through uh, Los Angeles and, and, you know, Orange Counties and whatever. And, and he said, listen, either get help or don't call me anymore. He was my only friend. I just moved to Los Angeles. And so I was like, I guess I'm going to go to a 12 step meeting. And that's what I did. Wow. Wow. Okay. So what was that like? Well, it was nuts because, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about 12 step meetings. So I asked a friend of mine, I detoxed myself. I didn't know you could die. I just turned 23. I didn't know you could die from alcohol detox. Yep. So thank God I was still young. Um, now it'd kill me. Right. But I was still young. And so, um, I detoxed myself and I called a friend of mine and I said, will you go with me to a meeting? Now we didn't know that it was a closed meeting, right? But I was scared. So she went with me. We both got dressed up. We wore uh, dresses and makeup, which, you know, you don't necessarily wear that to a 12 step meeting. Uh, we arrived late because we didn't know what the parking situation was. And it took us a few minutes to park. And we left at the coffee break because we thought it was over. I mean, everything that you could do wrong, we did, right? Yeah, but I went and I heard the message and um, the next day I went back to it on my own to a different meeting and I sat next to a woman who had been a stripper and uh, the parking meter was only for an hour and the meeting was for an hour and a half and so I got up after an hour to go put money in the meter and she said, um, and she said, no, don't leave. And I said, well, I have to put money in the meter. I'm going to get a ticket. She said, you're going to get a ticket. Sit down. And because uh, she knew I would leave 
that she's like, you're not going to go put money in the meter and come back. And I was like, yeah, that's true. And I did get a ticket. So it was the most expensive 12 step meeting I've ever been to. But also she became my sponsor because a, she understood me and B, you know, she, uh, they said to me, find someone who has what you, what you want. And I was like, well, she's the prettiest woman in the room. You know, all the guys like her, you know, like she's funny. She's outgoing. She's a lot of things that I'm not. And I was like, that's what I want. Cause I thought that I'd get sober and magically, you know, lose a bunch of weight and all the guys would like me and whatever, but I didn't realize that it was the trauma that was keeping me from that. And so what happened for me is I did what I was told. I really did what I was told in the 12 step rooms, uh, but I wasn't able to get sober because what would happen is the trauma would come rushing in. And so after, you know, 90 days, uh, you know, six months, I would have to drink again because at that time, we're talking about the mid 90s. All right. There wasn't good trauma treatment available. And so I started at that point really a quest to learn how to be sober. And I was struck sober after two and a half years of relapsing. A very good, very dear friend of mine. Um, called me and said uh, that I'd met in the 12 step rooms said that he had liver cancer and he, I couldn't come to his house if I wasn't clean because he was afraid that I'd take his drugs, which was never my deal, but th those were his rules. Right. And I figured I could be so, I, I really adored this man. Um, he was a best-selling novelist and he encouraged me to write. He said, you're a writer and you write your books, you know? And I figured I could be sober longer than, uh, than he would live. I figured I could white knuckle it that long um, from diagnosis to death was five months for him. And uh, when I, the last time I saw him, I was complaining, you know, I was a newcomer. I was complaining about um, everything. I was complaining actually about traffic and uh, bitching and moaning. And uh, he pulled, cause I went over to his house, you know, four or five times a week. He pulled his oxygen mask off. He said, well, I'm dying. And he flicked it back on and I thought, wow, what a jerk you are. Pay attention to the dying man. How about that? Instead of complaining about traffic. And I said to him, I said, what do you want? And he said, I want to see you get a hundred days sober. He died. I had 103 days. Oh, wow. I had 103 days. And it was Friday night, which was when our home group was. And um, on my way to that meeting, I mean, crying, the, the car drove itself there because I was a mess. I should not have been behind the wheel of a car, sobbing. And I felt his presence in the car. And I just felt like the addiction was ripped out of me. And I have not had any appreciable, you know, I mean, a passing, you know, oh, that would be nice, but no appreciable desire to use um, since then. And that was, you know, 23 years ago. So I'm struck sober. Yeah. And, but I have all this trauma response. Yeah. So what does a person do with that? Right. And that's really where I had this, this quest is how does someone recover I had directions of how to recover from addiction and how does someone also recover from trauma and how do we help the people who have both? Right. And that's really what my life's work has become is how do we have both? Um, and what happened for me in that transition is I had, I don't know, seven, eight years sober at that point and I was miserable. I was suicidal all the time. Um, I just didn't want to live anymore because the trauma symptoms, you know, I would have what are called body memories, right? Where you don't have, I don't have a, I don't have memory, like a movie, like normal, normal memories. I have memories that I have feelings in my body and I'd feel, you know, that, that first moment of penetration, but as a seven-year-old, right? Where the, the uh, anatomy doesn't fit, right? Mm -hmm. So just screaming pain. 30, 40, 50 times in succession. A person can't live like that. So it was suicidal all the time. And I, you know, but I couldn't drink, you know, I couldn't drink. I just, that wasn't going to be the solution for me. And you still weren't doing any kind of medication? Were you medicated at all? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Wow. I did, I did for a short period. I took some antidepressants. Okay. Um, they didn't really do, they put, they put a floor under what I could feel you know, like how bad I could feel. But they also dulled all my emotions. Right. And if you're a writer, 
you have to be able to feel and feel pretty strongly because I have to feel it to get it on the page. That's my process. I don't know how a person would write and not have access to their emotions. And it didn't really stop me. I wasn't, I don't think I was ever going to kill myself. I just always wanted to. Right. You know, there's a, there's a, yeah. there's a certain point that you have to reach. And I don't know that I have that in me to actually, to actually do it. So I stopped taking antidepressants and that's it. That's all I had ever taken. The only other thing I've taken, I did take some, uh, anti-anxiety medications on airplanes, um, okay. uh, transit, trans, uh, uh, oceanic flights only, um, cause they're so strong. Um, and they kick up a craving in me, like there's no tomorrow, but I would take that because I had such anxiety. I had such anxiety. I was getting, I was actually going to get on an airplane when I had a meeting with my psychiatrist and he said, you're about ready to have a heart attack. Your heart is missing beats. And I was like, well, cause I'm getting on this airplane and he's like, take this pill or you're going to die. He's like, or don't go. Um, so I did take that, but no, no medication. If you're, this is my opinion, right? I'm not, a, I'm a PhD. I'm not a medical doctor. My opinion is that based on the research I've read and my personal experience and what other people have shared with me is that if your problem isn't actually biochemical, then medication isn't going to be the solution. I needed to work through the trauma and then I didn't have the trauma symptoms anymore. I, and I, my depression, what you would call depression, was really, uh, it, again, my opinion, was a trauma, a symptom of PTSD, right. which they're now starting to call complex CPTSD, complex PT, post-traumatic stress, as opposed to regular post-traumatic stress. So because my, my abuse happened when I was very young and for a long period of time, it was chronic. And so that gives a different very often gives a different set of symptoms and responses. So that's, so no, medication really was not very much a part of my story. I'm very much in favor of it. Listen, if you have a, a chemical imbalance, what we wanna get those chemicals straightened out. I mean, there's, there's a reason for medications and they can not help. But in my case, it wasn't very successful. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out, if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. The service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. So I know, I, you, I know you have more to your story, but fast forward how you got involved with Rock to Recovery. How did that come about? Right. So I was um, working for um, an addiction treatment facility in, um, in Malibu, California, one of the expensive, well-known ones. I was the director of research. And my job was to go all around the world and find the best complementary therapies that were available Okay. to pair with traditional psychotherapy. So my passion is complementary therapies. And it happened because when I was seven, eight, nine years, seven, eight years sober. And in those 12 step meetings, the uh, soldiers were coming back, the uh, veterans were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and they weren't getting sober and many of them were killing themselves. And I thought they, and they all have trauma. I related to them with tra through trauma. And I was like, there has to be something better 
there has to be better treatment for us. I didn't get sober to be depressed and suicidal. They're not even getting sober and killing themselves. There has to be better treatment. And that's what I wanted to find. And so a friend of mine owned this treatment facility and he said, come to work for me and find, find it. And we'll put it to work in our treatment facility. And, and that's how I wrote my first book, Ending Addiction for Good with, with Richard Tate. Okay. So I was at this treatment facility and I lived not anywhere near Malibu. And I would come in one day a year to do continuing education for the psychotherapists at the, at the facility. And while I was having lunch, Sonny Mayo, whose story is in the Rock to Recovery book, uh, walked in and he said, hey doc, do you wanna see my music session? And he told me about Rock to Recovery, right? So people uh, are, who are in treatment, this was a detox group that I went and saw, write and record a song in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, whatever it is. So in a, in a session, they write and record a song. And these are non-musicians. Right. This guy tells me that he's going to write and record a song with non-musicians in detox. I know who these people are, right? I've seen them already around the facility. I was like, no way. This is a train wreck, absolute train wreck. I want to see it. And then when I do see it, I'm going to go to the owner and be like, why you're sending me all around the world to, to study and research best practices. Why are we doing this thing? All right. So we, I go into the session and they write and record a song in an hour. Not <laughs> only do they write and record a song in an hour, it's pretty good. I mean, they weren't going to win a Grammy, but they were engaged and they were involved and they were, they left singing and they were happy. And I was like, what is this voodoo? And then the next morning I was flying out to go to the airport. But before that, I was going to give a lecture to the clients about uh, addiction and recovery. And at the very um, high end treatment centers, if you pay a lot of money, you get extra privileges. And one of the privileges you get at this place is you get to keep your phone. Well, Rock to Recovery has uh, more than 21,000 songs now on SoundCloud. So the songs are uploaded to SoundCloud. The next morning, the different groups were sharing their songs with each other, right? So a guy would walk up, he's like, hey, did you hear the song by Raw Oysters? That was the, the group I listened to. And the other guy was like, no, did you hear the song by Folding Chair? And I was like, this is magical. When have you ever seen anyone in addiction treatment so engaged? When have I ever seen anyone so excited about recovery, wanting to stay, wanting to do the hard work? Never. And proud of what they'd accomplished. And so by the end of the year, I was involved with Rock to Recovery because what I found out was that they wanted a book written. They wanted mm. a doctor to come on. Actually, Wes initially wanted uh, uh, medical research done and and. Rock to Recovery is in the process of getting, you know, actual research projects done on, on its on its programs. Um, there are two different research teams that are working on that right now. But I was like, you don't want you don't want research. You want a popular press book because the important thing, listen, insurance is going to pay for or not pay for anything. It, it's going to fight paying for anything that it doesn't have to pay for. I was like, so you can do all the studies you want to show how effective it is. It's not going to change what insurance does. I said, write a popular press book. And we can tell the public about the magic of music, in particular, of all the complementary therapies and what music itself does. And so that's what we did. We wrote a book, Rock to Recovery. Wow. Wow. You know, it's interesting. You know, we've had Brandon Jordan on from Rock to Recovery and we've had Wes Gear on. Yes. I don't know. You're telling us stuff that we haven't heard before. And it's fascinating. I mean... I I'm, I'm a singer, so I grew up with music. Okay. My mom was an organist and directed the choir, sang in the choir, played the organ. And so music's always been a big part of my life. And when I very first heard, I think we interviewed Wes first, hmm. when I heard about it, I think, you know, it really resonated with me how that, it makes total sense. And, but you explained it a little bit better and I like that. I, I think well, that's amazing. Yeah, so here's the thing about music. I'm the science behind the all of it, right? They're musicians, everybody in Rock to Recovery, they're all musicians. And so they go in and do what they do. Wes came to it by accident, right? He had been in rehab and there had been, um, you know, no music there, but he had his guitar and he'd play, you know, songs between the sessions, make up silly little country songs. And he's like, wait, people really respond very well to this, right? So 
I came in after I saw that it wasn't a debacle, I went immediately into the research, right? Before I signed on with the group, I went immediately into the research and said, why does this work? And I got a very clear picture. And one of the things that I had worked on before that, like I said, with my previous book, Ending Addiction for Good, what we found is that there is a synergistic effect that happens with complementary therapies. Listen, none of us, uh, Wes or, or Brandon Jordan or Sonny or I, none of us are going to tell you that writing a song cures addiction. Like that's, this is not how it works. No, I know. I understand. Right. But when we put these different modalities together, independently, they're all nice and they all make you feel good, but none of them are curative. But something happens when we put them together that they become synergistic and more than the sum of their parts. So music's contribution is that it builds a community of support when you're doing it like Rock to Recovery in a group, right? Because listen, in rehab, everybody hates everybody else. Right. You don't feel good. Right. You're on your last nerve. You're not, you're having not there to make day. friends. No, you're not having your best day. And if that guy talks about his mother, girlfriend, kid, boss one more time, I'm going to rip his throat out. <laughs> right. And so then we put you in this group and now you have to write a song together. And what we found is that through that vulnerability, because part of what Rocked Recovery specifically does is there's a check-in process, you know, and we found out like there's in the, in the book, we've included lyrics of some of the songs that people have written. And one is from a veteran. Um, and they talk about, uh, Hanley talks about uh, wanting to kill themselves. And they were very clear when they came to, to the uh, Air Force uh, Wounded Warrior Care event, that their intention was, I'll try it, but then I'm going to shoot myself. And that's what they wrote about. And they wrote, you know, I wanted to shoot myself on Sunday. Well, when you bring that to the group and then sing it as a spoken word piece and present it to an Air Force hangar full of, you know, the generals are there and your comrades are there, it builds a community of support. And people are going to check in on you. Yeah. Right. And so that's something that's different about music. The other thing that music provides is it dumps serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine into the brain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, so it makes you feel better. So if you and I, let's just assume you and I have normal brain chemicals, right? So we're here on any given day. Let's say we have a bad day, right? And so you're, you're in your car and you're driving home and a song you like comes on the radio and you sing along to it. You do your own carpool karaoke. You do not care who's listening. You do not care if you hit a bad note. What happens? You feel better, right? Because yep. your brain yep. dumps all these feel-good chemicals. So you and I go from here to here. We're like, wow, that's great. But if you're in an addiction treatment facility, if you have trauma or if you have, you know, these other, you know, Ill issues, your brain chemicals are probably down here, Right. Then we play music and sing together. Again, your brain does not care if you're good. It only cares that you do it. Now it dumps those feel-good chemicals and you jump up to here, yeah. right? You and I had just a little bump. They get what feels like a huge bump from the same amount of chemicals. So they leave with a natural high. So what happens is people want to keep doing it and they stay in treatment. Interesting. They stay in treatment. So those are the two things that Rock to Recovery can give, can give you. Most people don't have access to that. So what about you and I who are not in an addiction treatment or a mental health facility or an eating disorder <clears throat> clinic? So the book Rock to Recovery has 18 stories in it. Mine is one of them. Wes's is, Wes is number one. I'm number 18 because in, in Jewish tradition, 18 is high. It's life, okay. right? So it's, I, I, I wanted to be the last chapter, the life chapter. But it, we show you how you can use music in your own life, whether it's writing your own lyrics, you know, because one of the things about music too is it allows us access to emotions that we can't talk about. Yeah. So I'd go to therapy and a lot of people with trauma who have dissociation, right? They don't feel their feelings. I'd go to therapy. First of all, I couldn't say the word incest for two years. I'd literally say, uh, 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 and then write the word down, give it to my therapist and then um, dissociate and couldn't. I couldn't tell you what the heck I talked about for the whole rest of the session. So that wasn't useful to me. It wasn't a good use of my time. Music allows us to get past that 
so that maybe someone else sings the lyrics for the first time, but we get through it and then we can share that information. You don't have to be in an addiction treatment facility to do that and to have right. that. But so you did it, you experienced the music Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So one of the things, so after I, so I agreed to write the book. Yeah. And I went down to Southern California and uh, had all these interviews set up. I, I met with almost all of the Rock to Recovery program administrators. I met with Wes um, and then I interviewed a whole bunch of veterans and, and people with eating disorders and all, all sorts of different, you know, people. And then I came back and holding that space, doing those interviews and taking in people's stories really caused me to have a sort of a breakdown. Um, and so I started writing songs like a rock to recovery mm -hmm. session, actually sending them to Brandon Jordan. I was like, let me share these with you. And, and, and how can I, you know, so we had our own sort of rock to recovery. And I also started doing um, a different kind of therapy, somatic experiencing, where I got into those feelings. So the combination of, again, none of these things on their own is tremendously effective. Right, right. With the somatic experiencing, with acupuncture, with the music programming, and with other things that I was doing. I also work with narrative, right? Changing your story. You know, what's true? I don't believe most things are true with a capital T, like water's wet, that might be truth with a capital T, right? Um, water, at least water in liquid form is wet, water is ice, not so wet, you know? So, but what are the little T's that I can pivot my life on, right? And so one of them was that I was about 325 pounds when I started with Rock to Recovery. And, um, it was pointed out to me that, and it was because my father had said, I, I don't, I don't want to sleep with, with large, with large women. Mm. Of course I was neither large, nor was I a woman. I was a child, you know, but none of that made any sense. What I heard was get fat, get safe. And so I did, right. I wanted to be an immovable mound of flesh that you would either a not notice or b not be able to do anything with. And it was pointed out to me as like, you get approached by predators all the time, no matter what weight you are. Oh, truth bomb, truth bomb. Honey, your weight doesn't have anything to do with whether or not someone wants to assault you. And I immediately, I mean, just my weight just went, Ooh, and I lost <laughs> and have that uh, 75 pounds in less than a year. And I've had, and I've kept it off for, you know, three years. Wow. So I work with, so I work with narrative too, right? Change yeah, 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 yeah. Life. So all of these things together, right? Now my life is different. And that's what I get to write about. You know, I've been so afraid of men. And I write about this in, in my story in the book. I've been so afraid of men. And then I found myself on the red carpet. I'm the only woman in the middle of all the rock to recovery guys. There's, there's, 14, 15, 16 guys all around me. I'm literally in the center of the donut, right? And I was like, how did this happen? How did I get in the band? I'm not even a musician. How did I get They're like, I don't know, Doc, but you're in the band and you're one of us. And, you know, <laughs> what is truth? How does a, mus a non-musician get in the band? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I go to a show, I walk backstage and people do not stop me. You know, because I look like I belong there. I Again, I don't know. What is truth? What is truth? So these are the things that we get to look at. These are the things that we get to look at. And yeah, I did all these things and my life's different. I never imagined. When I was getting sober, right? I finally got sober. I was, I was 25 years old. I never, never imagined that I would live, first of all, to see 30. Nobody thought I'd live to see 30. I travel all over the world. I've been every, you know, I said to myself, I said, you know, I really want to see the Sphinx. Please God, send a, send a conference in Egypt. And not, not three months later, a conference gets posted in Cairo. Oh, and I went, wow. and so my boss paid me to go see the Sphinx. I love it. Right. And I got to go and, and speak to people in the Middle East who don't necessarily have access to good mental health services. What do good mental health services look like and what can you do at that time? Um, uh, uh, Syrian refugees were flooding into Europe and I was like, help us. 
We need Arabic speaking, culturally competent psychotherapists in Europe to help with these refugees. Yeah. I got to do that. I never, who, who gets to do that? <laughs> a, a drunk like me, a drunk like me. I used to get so drunk. First of all, I never smoked, but someone would try it, would, would, would light a cigarette for me and I couldn't even hold it in my mouth. Yeah. It would just fall out and I'd just watch it on the ground because I was so drunk, I couldn't bend over, <laughs> right? To pick it up, I'd fall down. I mean, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be 50 years old. I have written books that have won awards. I've written an Amazon bestseller. I travel the world. I have wonderful friends. I have an amazing life, a drunk like me. <laughs> should not have that. And that's, that's why I'm so passionate about complementary therapies. Cause I'm like, healing is possible. You do not have to suffer. Yep. You do not have to suffer. And we give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to use music to help improve your life in the book. I think that's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Is the book available on Amazon? Everywhere books are sold. Yeah. It's, um, uh, ebook, uh, 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 paperback and in probably right after Thanksgiving will be a uh, uh, audio book as well. That's awesome. Constance, yeah. thank you for telling your, your story today. It's a great story. Thank and I you. love the whole tie in with Rock to Recovery. We have such, my husband and I, we just have such affinity for the idea of using music and aesthetics to help people in recovery. And you've really added a whole other chapter to that. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Like I said, the book is on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. You rock. You rocked to recovery, but you rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're pretty <laughs> rad too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> wow, quite the story. I, I hate stories about child abuse. It just makes me a little bit ill. It makes me a lot ill, actually. Um, but here's the thing, she eventually got clean and sober and music and Rock to Recovery helped her with that. So that's huge. Again, the book is called Rock to Recovery and you should check it out on Amazon because if you're in recovery and you're struggling, you just might find that music could help you even if you've never touched an instrument or sang a note in your life. You can do it. So check it out. If you need to get into treatment or you know somebody that needs to get into treatment, please reach out. There's so many resources out there for you, but just don't wait because waiting is never a good idea. We will have another interview coming up that my husband is super excited about. So stay tuned. We will talk to you soon. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.